guys, welcome to uh, a later than normal Friday waffle. Now, firstly, apologies about the uh, absolutely awful camera angle. Um, <laughs> as you can tell, I'm uh, well. I'm sitting in my kitchen and I'm using my Samsung tablet, but uh, my daughter's upstairs in the games room, hence the reason I'm downstairs. So, apologies for this being a wee bit later than usual. Um, so, yeah, I hope you're all. I hope you're all good. Um, um, I am uh, going back to work on the Monday. I've had two weeks off. Thoroughly enjoyed my time off. Not done a great deal, I have to say. Um, but it's been nice just to kind of switch off and completely relax. I have been occasionally looking at my emails. Not actually reading emails, works emails, but just looking to see how many there are. And there's quite a lot, so I've got that fun to look forward to on Monday. But yeah. Um, it's kind of bizarre, as much as I enjoy being on holiday, I I think when you're, when you're working full time, you just get used to, you know, you get used to working Monday to Friday and then you look forward to the weekend. When you're off for a couple of weeks, you lose that, you lose the sort of, you, you, you start to kind of forget what day it is and you just get into a kind of routine of getting up late and... You end up, every day just becomes another day. You don't really look forward to it because you know that you're off for a while. So as much as I do enjoy being off on holiday, there's a little bit of me actually enjoys the routine of being at work Monday to Friday. It means I'm not dreading going back. You don't have that horrible sickly feeling that you get when you're going back to work. And also, you're not, you know, you're not looking at the emails. You're not thinking, oh, I've got all these hundreds of emails to kind of deal with. Plus the other thing is, it, it literally does give you something to look forward to. You look forward to the weekend coming. You look forward to five o'clock at night. You look forward to the weekend coming. So, yeah, like I said, I've not been up to a great deal. The weather has largely been rubbish. I mean, it was quite nice last week. Or the, not last week, the week before, I should say. Um, last week, it was just heavy rain. I did manage to get my, uh, my garden fence painted, which is uh, quite good. That's about the only real productive thing that I've done. I've also, uh, gaming wise, I've not been playing, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at the my meme cab, I've not put that on, I've not played that for probably about a month, which is quite unusual because I do make a point of switching it on and just playing it, but I've literally not played it for a long time. So I really need to get back, kind of back to it. But gaming wise, the only thing I've been playing, which I mentioned last week, was Resident. Resident Evil 2 on the PlayStation 4 now I believe it's a remake of the original play, uh, the original PlayStation 2 game Resident Evil 2 funnily enough um, really enjoying it I think what makes it slightly less uh, slightly less uh, what do you call it annoying is the fact that, yeah, and I think I again mentioned this last week, you can basically save it. Any time you get to a typewriter, you can save it. You don't have to find the typewriter reels, ink ribbons, which the original uh, Resident Evil uh, programs, not programs, games had. And that just made for an incredibly frustrating experience because it's all very well having a tough game, but removing the ability to save a game, to me it doesn't really bring anything new to the table, it doesn't make, it, yeah it's obviously going to make the, the game more difficult because if you die you then go right back to the start, but that doesn't make the game more fun, if anything it makes the game more frustrating and as far as I'm concerned I'm probably less likely to actually play the game because of that, so because this has got it's removed the restrictions with the ink cables or the ink ribbon things. It basically means that you can save as often as you want. I mean, if you really wanted, you could go and do like a mission, whatever, and then go back and save it again. So that makes it a lot more fun as far as I'm concerned. But I've got to say, the graphics are just absolutely phenomenal. I mean, there's a lot of PC, hardcore PC uh, gamers who will completely dismiss consoles as being a, a legitimate platform to play games on because, you know, they're outdated technology. Yeah, the PlayStation 4 is like four or five years old graphic-wise, 
But I've got a mate who saw, I can't remember what game it was, yeah, Are We Out? I was showing him that, and he seemed to think that the graphics on the PS4 were just as good as a cutting edge PC. Yeah, it may not be the same high res, sort of high resolution, but, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the graphics on the PlayStation 4, I've got the Pro, which uh, I think it does the same resolution, but it just, it's a bit quicker. The graphics are absolutely phenomenal. But the PlayStation, sorry, the uh, Resident Evil 2 is a great game. Um, it's scary. The atmosphere is wonderful. The graphics are wonderful. Obviously, the sound, it goes without, it goes without saying, is really, really good as well. So I don't know how far I'm into the game. I mean, I'm probably, I don't know. It doesn't actually tell you. I don't think it tells you on the same thing. I'm maybe about trying to, I'm just trying to guess. I'm maybe five hours into it. Um, I'm a fair bit into it, I don't know how long the game actually lasts, but really enjoying it, really, really enjoying it. But that's been the only kind of gaming stuff that I've actually done. Um, yeah, there's not been anything, there's not been anything else. Even though I've been off, I've not been playing, playing very much. I mean, I was doing a lot of video making, not last week, the week before. Yeah, it was last week actually. Um, but anyway... Um, I don't have an awful lot to talk about. There's a few questions there which I'm, I'm going to answer shortly. Um, as I've already mentioned, uh, Blackpool, play Blackpool. I am going down there uh, the Saturday and the Sunday. Now, it looks like... Oh, excuse me, I'm really rude. For yawning on camera. Um, another of the special guests is the guys from Houston. Andrew, I was going to say Andrew Braybrook, what's his name? Andrew, is it Andrew Houston? Is it? I can't remember. <laughs> anyway, the guys from Houston, um, it, it might be that I'm going to be doing the, the sort of interview for them as well. That's on the Saturday. And then I've got Sean Southern and Andrew Morris from Magnetic Fields, aka Lotus Turbo Challenge. I've got them on the Sunday. So looking forward to that. Um, I think it should be really, really good fun. Hopefully the one on the Saturday, um, I'm looking to maybe tie up with another fellow YouTuber. I'm not going to say the name because it might not happen, but we're hopefully going to, the two of us are going to do a sort of an interview at the same time, which I think is probably good. I mean, as, as much as it's fun doing an interview on your own, it obviously puts a bit more pressure on you when it's just you and your own. But I think if there's two people, then it, it gives you somebody else to kind of bounce ideas off as well. Maybe get a bit more kind of banter going as well. So that's uh, that's October. That's uh, Play Blackpool, the 12th and 13th of October. Doing that. Um, what else? Anything else? Yeah, Lawn Boys Post 1975. He made a video earlier this week. Last week? Is it this week? Last week? Would I call it? I would call it. See, I always, I don't know, when does the week start? I always think the week starts on a Monday and it finishes on a Sunday. I don't know if that's the case. I always, that's the way I look at it. So I would call, like, the days Monday to Friday that it's just passed, I would call that this week because we're still in the week. So anyway, Dave was asking a question. Why has there never been a really, really good uh, Back to the Future game? Now, from what I believe, there have been three games uh, based on the three films. Obviously, the first one, second one, and third one. And they were released, I think they were released, certainly on... They were certainly... Oh, excuse me. They were certainly released on the, the 8-bit computers, and I would think they were released on the 16-bit as well. Maybe not the, the first one, because that came out... When did, when did Back to the Future games come out? I don't actually know, but I've never played them, but I do know from listening to other people talking about them that they are pretty poor. They're pretty poor, uh, pretty poor games. Which, when you consider just how popular and iconic the films are, it's, it's disappointing that they never had a, good, a really good game made of them. But then I suppose you could see that the same about a lot of films. I mean, well, Star Wars, Jaws, they both came out mid-70s, so computers weren't really a thing back then. But, yeah, as we all know, you know, doing a, doing a, 
a licensed uh, game based on a film as possible. I mean, you've got you've got Robocop, you've got Batman, you've got The Untouchables. You know, there's there's various other games that have been based on films that have actually proven to be really really good. For me personally, I was never really a fan of uh, games based on films because the thing about a film, it's 90 minutes long and there's a lot of things that happen. So what generally they do when it comes to making a game off a film is they will kind of try and identify key scenes in a film and then they'll turn it into a little... Uh, and a sort of mini sub game, if you will. Now, to me, that I don't really enjoy that kind of thing because you're just playing little mini games, and it's not really. I'm not really a hundred percent sure that a a game of a film works properly. Yeah, you can play key scenes, but which might be a wee bit fun, but I don't know. There was one game which I've never played and I do own it. And again, it's meant to be a really good game and it was The Warriors, obviously based on the film of the same name. I mean, that was a film that came out in the very, very early 80s, I think it was. And The Warriors is kind of... The, the, the good thing about that was, at that point, the Xbox and the PlayStation 2, I think it was, they were both out. So you had the hardware that allowed these games to be quite uh, quite involved. Whereas the old 8-bits and even the 16-bit machines, it, you could only rely on little mini-games, which, to my mind, they don't really make a good fun game. Don't get me wrong, I did enjoy Batman. I did enjoy the Batman game because the, the, the little mini-games, I mean, especially the, bit, the driving scene where you, you fly up the road and you've got this sort of pole, not the pole, you've got the hook, which latches onto a pole to kind of help you turn. That was really good. That was like really, really arcadey. But yeah, I don't think... The, 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 the reason the Warriors was so successful is because the Xbox was obviously, compared to an 8-bit machine, it was a very, very capable platform. So it was able to kind of... It had the, the grunt and the, the technical uh, ability to do a game the way it should really be done. If I was going to make... If I was wanting a game based on Back to the Future, it would have to be it would have to be a kind of sandbox game based on like Grand Theft Auto 4, a sort of open-ended game where you can just walk about Hill Valley, you can walk about go into the school, you can you can go wherever you want, you can drive about. But You've got to, there are key scenes, you've got to go and visit the professor at a certain time, you've got to be there at a certain time. So all the things that happened in the film, they could have been incorporated into the game. You know, so I think, yeah, a, a Grand Theft Auto type sandbox game would be awesome. You know, um, I don't know whether you're ever going to get a modern remake of Back to the Future. I mean, it's an old film. I mean, it's now, what, 85, 95, 2005. So, I mean, it's now, is it 34 years old? Wow, that, that makes me feel so, so old. I actually went to see it when I, I was, it was the first date I went to see it with a girl. Um, yeah, that's mental. But, yeah, I do think that with modern hardware, PlayStation 4, whatever it is, PC, Switch, you could really get a good Back to the Future game. But I think the reason, the, re well, the question Dave was answering, or asking I should say, was why were the games so shite? And I think it's probably just down to the fact that the hardware just wasn't really capable. But, like I says, there were some good uh, good licensed games like ba you know, Batman. Batman? Batman, I should say, by Ocean Software. Um, it was possible to get a good game off a film, but unfortunately, I just think that the, I don't know, I don't know why, um, I don't know why it never really took off. The thing is, and I don't know if I'm talking nonsense, I mean, Back to the Future, when you look back in it, no pun intended, it was, 
it's one of the most iconic film franchises of the 80s, in fact, indeed, ever. It was such a good, uh, it was such a well-made film. It really got you thinking. But I'm trying to remember, back in the day, I don't think it really had, it wasn't hyped um, as much as you would expect it to back then. I mean, I remember seeing the film, went to see it, I said it was with my girlfriend, and then I enjoyed it that much. I went with my mum and, my mom and dad to see it, and I think they actually went a second time as well. It was one of these films when you saw it, it just it, it left a, a dent in you. It was a wonderful, wonderful film, but I don't remember if it was as big back in 1985 as it is now. I actually think that the popularity of the film franchise has grown years after the film came out. I might be talking nonsense, I don't know, but yeah, I think, I, th I do think it was down to the hardware, the limitation of the hardware was the reason that there wasn't a particular good game. I mean, uh, Chris Novabug, he was, I was watching his video, he was doing a sort of a, a VR response to Dave. And he was saying how, yeah, you could have at the start when Marty's trying to get, he's getting chased with the Iranian terrorists, you could have had a sort of like a, a you know, in a car chase scene type thing. Um, you know, he was trying to explain how you could actually do the film. And yeah, there's, there are one or two real key moments, but I don't think, I personally, I don't really think of Back to the Future as an action-packed film. A lot of the the appeal of the film was just based on the really good storyline, the fact that he was going, you know, he was he was jumping back and forwards between the past and the future, and you know, but would that translate to being a good computer game? I'm not sure. And even just talking now, I'm starting to actually doubt whether a good game would really be possible based on Back to the Future. I don't know. I think if they were going to do it, I think it would have to, it would have to be along the lines of a sort of sandbox type game. Um, you know, when you've got the you've got the eighties music, you've got the good graphics, you get to drive the DeLorean, all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it was a missed opportunity. I'm sure if I don't even know who done the. Uh, done the films, I don't think it was Ocean. I don't think it was. Perhaps if they had got the film licenses. Because these were the these were the guys that everybody went to. Anytime there was a big uh, a new film, these were the go-to guys. You know, it wouldn't have surprised me if some film companies actually approached Ocean to make the games. Because up until that point, computer games were always just looked upon as a childish kind of hobby. But then I think it wasn't long before companies started to realise that, wait a minute, there's actually money to be made in this whole computer thing. Especially nowadays, when you think of how much money is actually, you know, involved in this industry. I mean, you watch the title credits for any kind of modern game, and it runs to like, I wouldn't say thousands, but it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of different people, and the budgets are phenomenal. The only other, I, I completely forgot to mention, there was a game, and what's the name of the company? Is it Telltale Games? Basically, it's kind of like a comic strip where you don't... Now, I've only... I've watched my daughter playing it. You kind of make choices. I don't think you walk about like using a joystick, but you kind of make choices. You get given a choice of things... Do you say that? If somebody asks, do you want to go here or there or whatever, you've got to decide where you want to go. So it's kind of like an interactive storybook. And again, yeah, it was based on Back to the Future, but I don't think it was based on the film. I think it was based either before the film started or after it. I can't remember. I don't really know. Like I said, I, I have got it on my PC, but like most people, we've got all these games in Steam and you never actually use them. So that was probably the best attempt at a Back to Future game, but I think if they really wanted to do it justice, it would 100% have to be, you need to get a capable machine like a PlayStation 4 or something, and make it like Grand Theft Auto, I think that would be pretty damned awesome. Right, just, I don't know why I'm even going to mention this. I, I saw something somewhere and it just made me think I'm going to talk about it. Emulation. 
what do you think of emulation? Now, there's a big, big group of people who would look down the nose at people who want to emulate machines. You know, they, they somehow get it into their head that because you don't own any real machines, all you do is emulate, that you're in somehow, you're not entitled to an opinion about things, you're not really a retro gamer, you're not, you don't love retro games. Now, I think that is an absolute pile of nonsense. I love emulation, I really, really do. I mean, I've been emulating machines pretty much since since I got my Amiga, when I first got a Spectrum emulator for the Commodore Amiga, and then I got one for the C64, then when I eventually got my PC, I started, I was, I was emulating these machines, then MAME came along, and you know, when I make my videos uh, for my channel, I largely do use emulation. The only time I don't use emulation is really for disk-based systems. I mean, you know, I'm lucky enough, excuse me, I'm lucky enough that I've got the original hardware for pretty much every system that I want. There's a few systems I don't have and it's because I don't really have any interest in them. I don't have the Master System and I don't have an N64. I used to, don't have an NES either. Um, I've not really got much interest in them, but so I could quite happily use, you know, real hardware for recording videos because I've got it. But the reason I use emulation is because it's for convenience sake, because you've got all the games on your computer, you've got the wonderful uh, turbo load and you don't have to hang about and wait. Um, you don't have to set up anything, you just run the pick the game and run the emulator and away you go. And it also means recording video footage or game footage for videos. It looks a lot better than me pointing a camera at a TV like I did in the old days. If you're a, a long uh, time subscriber to my channel, you'll know that the first batch of videos that I did, it was literally, I would point the phone at the camera, at the TV I should say, and just play it. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's quite quirky. It gives it a bit of character and that kind of stuff, but... Yeah, when it comes to making videos, you've really got to, to my mind, unless you've got some kind of fancy video grabber hardware, which I don't have, I don't have any of that kind of stuff, I would always use emulation. But getting away from YouTube and recording videos, is there anything wrong? What is the pros and cons of emulation? The good part of emulation, which I've already touched on, A, it's cheap. You know, you can generally get emulators don't really cost any money. The only ones you have to pay money for is uh, if you've got like, if you want to run emulators on your Android phone or your tablet, whatever, there's a few emulators you've got to pay a few quid for, but generally I don't think I've ever come across, in fact the only emulator that I paid money for, if I remember rightly, was Magic Engine, which is a, it's a PC engine, uh, Turbo Graphics, whatever you want to call it, uh, emulator, I mean, I, that was one of the very, very first ones that I ever had. Probably talking about 2000, something like that, maybe, just after the internet came about. I don't remember, but... Yeah, the good thing about emulation is 99% of emulators are completely free. The games, you know, there are some games that are extremely expensive to buy. I mean, we seem to be in a position at the moment with retro collecting where games and systems are going for pretty much daft money. I'm, I'm kind of slouching down a wee bit. They're going for real daft money. I mean, I was, you know, I was, what was I going to look for? I actually thought to myself, I quite fancy get myself some more Jaguar games. Atari Jaguar. I know it's a, a system that a lot of people dismiss, you know, they, they, it's, you know, it, it wasn't a system that did well at all, you know, it's one, it would be, it would technically be classified as a field system, which I think is a wee bit unfair, but, you know, there weren't that many games released for it, so I did, I thought, I'm going to try and pick up some more games, and even unbox games are going for like 40 quid, so they're, they're going for quite a lot of money, now I know you could probably argue and say, well, wait a minute, I was paying 40 quid for a SNES game 30 years ago, and you'd be absolutely right, but I don't think I would be overly comfortable about paying 30 quid for an old game now. 
but that's kind of where we are when it comes to old systems. The prices seem to be, they do go up and down, but it just seems that we're on a kind of crest of a wave at the moment. I don't mean that in a good way, as far as hardware goes. I mean, you look at a, a Vectrex, you'll pay probably £200 as a minimum, a bare minimum for a system. Games go for daft money as well. So the great thing about an emulator is, A, you can get the emulator completely for free, and B, you'll be able to get the games um, for free as well. I've never had a problem downloading games. I mean, you know, because 99% of the systems that I emulated were, you know, they were defunct systems. They weren't systems that you could actually make any money on um, as far as them being commercially viable. You know, they'd all, they were all old systems. So, yeah, you've got the, the, the cheapness factor. You've got the emulator for free. You've got the games for free. Yeah, it's... Since Nintendo took out an injunction against... Uh, people hosting Nintendo ROMs, it has meant that a few of the real popular ROM sites have now closed down, which is unfortunate. Which it means getting a hold of older systems is quite difficult, but there are still plenty of other websites out there. Just use Google, you'll soon find them. I mean, one of the ones that I've recently signed up for, I can't remember what it's called, the Classic something or another, whatever it's called. And it costs, I can't remember how much it costs, it costs maybe 20 quid and a year, maybe not as much as that. And basically that allows you to go in and download all your ROMs. So I don't mind paying that, you know what I mean? Paying 20 quid for a year to be able to access all these games is wonderful. But because I've been in emulators for so long, I have pretty much, I've pretty much got every single game ROM that I want. Yeah, you could say, well, it would be nice to have every single PlayStation game or every single Sega Saturn game, but the problem is that these, I mean, can you imagine how many PlayStation uh, games there were that were released? You must be talking thousands. Now, these were all on CD, so to download a thousand CDs capacity, you would need, you would need tons and tons of storage space, so... You know, I don't bother with these ones really because, like I says, if I'm going to play, if I was going to make a video based on a Sega Saturn game, I would absolutely just uh, point the camera at the TV and play it for real. So yeah, emulation is cheap. It's generally pretty easy to use. <coughs> the downside to emulation is... I call it the PlayStation Two PlayStation Syndrome, basically where you have so many thousands of games. We've all loaded up Mame, and it lists like ten thousand games, and you just scroll through them all, and you think, what 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 am I going to play here? I can't think of anything I want to play, and you end up not playing anything because you've just got the selection of games you've got is just too damn big. So you've got that as a problem. I mean, you could quite easily... It, that doesn't have to be a problem, but the, the mere fact that you've got all these thousands of games on a computer means that sometimes you don't really know what you want to play and then nine times out of ten you end up playing nothing because the, the selection is just too big. If you've got a Mega Drive and maybe 20 games on a shelf, then you're able to pick the box off the shelf, look at the cover, look at the back of the box maybe read the instructions and it makes you want to play it, you lose that. You don't have that kind of uh, extra added excitement, if you want to call it that, with emulation. You know, you've, all you've got is a list of games, whereas when you've got real hardware, you've got the box, you've got the instructions, you've got the screenshots, you know, so you've got that. You lose that with emulation, obviously. Now, the next one is probably the biggest uh, thing that I don't like about emulation and that is the lack of uh, using a proper controller. I mean, any 8-bit machine, it was always going to be either keys or joystick. You know, you never ever used, you wouldn't have used a gamepad on the Commodore 64 back in 1985 because they simply didn't exist. Gamepads did not exist then. Yeah, the NES came along, they brought out the gamepad, but it was absolutely years later before you know, you got a gamepad that you could plug into a PC. 
And that is, like I said, that's the biggest, the biggest thing for me and my argument against why using real hardware is always better than emulators. It's because of the experience. You've got the proper joystick. If I was going to be playing a Commodore 64 game, if I was going to be playing Drop Zone, it would have to be a proper joystick with the fire button. I don't want a SNES pad. I don't want an analog uh, Xbox 360 pad. So you lose that. If you're using, if you're playing a C64 game on a PC using an Xbox controller, yeah, you can still enjoy the game, but it doesn't really feel like you're playing a Commodore 64 game. Whereas if you load up a game on a proper C64 and you've got the, the C64 in front of you and you've got a joystick in your hand, you're getting the whole the whole experience, you know, uh, and that's that can never really be a, a understated how much fun, how good it is getting to play old systems, playing games on old systems the way they were written. Plus as well as sometimes there, you might get slowed down in certain games and when you play in an emulator you don't always get that. So if you want an authentic gaming experience, you know, then by all means use real hardware. Um, you've got a proper controller, whereas when you're using you're using emulators, you may not be using the proper controller. I mean, you certainly couldn't. Well, I suppose there is, you could use a gamepad to play SNES games, NES games. There's a little adapter, which I've got two of them actually. Um, I got an eBay, and it basically allows you to plug in an Atari, is a 9-pin joystick, and then it plugs into the USB, which means that I can play a C64 game under emulation using a proper controller. So that does... That does go some way to to kind of make an experience feel feel kind of more authentic. The downside to that's about the only downside I would say for emulation is you're losing the you're losing the whole experience of maybe you're not using the correct controller and you're not actually you're sitting in front of a, a you know you're sitting in front of a, a thirty inch monitor. Uh, at your PC, it just doesn't feel like you're using a Spectrum, whereas to actually use a Spectrum, have the Spectrum on your lap or in front of you and pressing the rubber keys, it's, you're getting the full, the, you're getting the full authentic experience. The big, 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 big downside to using real hardware, you've got the cost, obviously you've got the cost which I've already mentioned, the price of games, the price of hardware, you know, it's, it can be a lot of money. It really, really can. So you've got that. And the second point, a point which kind of piggybacks the whole cost thing, is reliability. I mean, I've lost count the number of systems, old systems, which I've went to switch on and it just doesn't work. You know, for whatever reason, it doesn't work. Now, I'm completely, I'm a complete cat-handed buffoon when it comes to technology. So if I was to switch on a, a SNES and it didn't work, I'm pretty screwed. To be honest with you, I've not got the ability, I don't have the technical know-how to get uh, something like that working again. So, you know, you're, it's, you need to understand that these companies that made the SNES, that made the C64, the Spectrum, the BBC, I don't think for one second these companies ever, ever expected people to be using their hardware 35 years later. I mean, you buy any piece of electronic equipment or a kettle or a toaster or a I was going to say a video recorder, you know, a Blu-ray player, you'll get, a, you'll get a, a year's guarantee. In other words, they will guarantee that they will replace any part if it fails within a year. We're using these 35 years on. <laughs> so they're basically 34 years overdue. So, you know, th th these systems were never, and this, this goes for arcade cabinets, by the way, these systems were never designed to be getting used 30, 40 years on. And so, if you've got an original hardware, can you imagine how you'd feel if you bought a Vectrex for 250 quid and you switch it on and it stops working? You know, you'd be gutted. You'd be absolutely gutted. Unless you've got the wear for all to fix it, which I certainly don't, then you've got something which is basically an expensive paperweight. You can do one of two things. You can ask for somebody, you know, try and Google it and see if somebody can fix it for you and it might end up costing you an absolute fortune. 
or you can try and buy another one, you know. So that's that's the plus points. The plus of emulation, it's easy and it's cheap, and you've got all these games. The downside is you're not getting the full experience. You're sitting at a PC and you're maybe not using the correct controller. The good points about using real hardware is it's authentic experience. You've got the you've got the game running the way it was programmed to run. And more importantly, you've got a proper controller. So whether it's the N64 and you've got the little analog stick thing, or whether it's a SNES, you've got the pad, or more importantly, if you're playing a, a Spectrum or Commodore 64, you've got an old, you know, quick shot two joystick, you really, really feel like you're getting the, the full experience. So yeah, but like I say, as, as far as emulation goes, you know, it really annoys me when I hear people diss people for running emulators. So what? You know what? As long as as long as people are enjoying playing games, enjoying the whole hobby, then what is the problem? I don't get it. Um, don't get it at all. So anyway, listen, what I'm going to do now is, uh, where are we? I've managed to talk nonsense for 40 minutes or 36 minutes. I'm just going to jump straight into last week's Friday Waffle. Um, Panther UK, you are talking about super pipeline, etc. How would you like to see these, see these done on a modern system? Now, I think that was a question from last week. If I was, I'm generally not a fan of modern updates for, for uh, old games because, like I've said before, it's the same in music, it's the same with uh, films. You go and see a film and you come away at the cinema thinking that is the most amazing film ever. And then um, when the sequel comes out, it never quite, it never quite reaches that plateau of how good you think it is. And it's the same with games. I mean, if you get a game, can you imagine, like Jetpack? Jetpack is an absolutely phenomenal game in the spectrum. It really is. Yeah, you look at the graphics; they're basic. They're you know, they're really nothing to write home about. But it just plays so well. The little quirky, farty, squeaky, buzzy noises that the spectrum makes that suits that game perfectly. That's exactly how you want to remember it by. Then you. I mean, they brought out a remake of that on, it was on the uh, arcade, Xbox Arcade Live, whatever it's called. And, yeah, they captured the essence of the game, but they'd added new graphics, etc. And I don't know, it just, it kind of lost something. It lost something, going from what we're used to playing it on to something that's super duper, really fancy. It just didn't feel, didn't feel the same. And it's the same with these modern games. If I was, I would love to see Super Pipeline 2 uh, remade for a modern system. I would virtually guarantee that I would probably come away thinking, yeah, it's good fun, but it's not as good. I mean, I'll give you an example. Arcade uh, Live, you know, the Xbox 360 arcade, they brought out a lot of games. I mean, you had Scramble, you had Frogger, you had Track and Field, you had Gyrus, a uh, Russian attack or Green Berets we called it in the UK, loads of classic arcade games, and they had they always gave you the original graphics and sound. Then they also gave you an enhanced version. It was the same game, but it had enhanced graphics and enhanced sound. And ninety nine times out of hundred, I will always play. The original graphics with the original sound because it's just it just doesn't feel right it just doesn't feel right at all um playing the new graphics so as far as super pipeline 2 it would be interesting to see that's not that's not a game i would particularly like to see a remake of i don't think it would ever um capture the essence and fun of the original one the one game i did mention i'd like to see done, I was not going to say done properly, with a, you know, a brand new version would be Way of the Exploding Fist. I would love to see it done, but the graphics, it would have to retain exactly the same game mechanics. I don't want any extra features added. And I think that's where sometimes they spoil old games when they remake them. They add in features. We don't want the new features. We want to just be able to play it as we remember it. Yeah, by all means, make the graphics look a bit better, better sound, whatever. So I'd love to see a way of exploding fist with 
really super detailed. I mean, if you look at the, you know the latest uh, Street Fighter, I don't know what we're up to Street Fighter five, six, whatever it is. The graphics are phenomenal, and that game that's a perfect example of a taking a classic game, sticking with the same game mechanics, but just enhancing the graphics. And I would love to see Wave the Exploding Fist have that treatment, have the same guys, you know, look the same, but just have them more modern looking. But I want to have them, I want them to have the same, the red, the white uh, suits on, you know, keep the same music, by all means do a remix of it, bring it up to date, but don't tinker with game mechanics, because the minute you start tinkering with game mechanics, adding in extra features, then you just completely lose it as far as I'm concerned. But uh, yeah, like I says, I think largely classic games should just be left well alone. Whoops, a daisy. Um, yeah, I'm not a massive fan of uh, what have I done there? I'm not a massive fan of of changing games just for the you know updating them just for the sake of it. Hang on, you can be quiet, Alan. Anyway, Chris, thanks for your question, buddy. Uh, 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 I don't think there's too many questions actually Mr Thornbar Stephen Thornbar hi, St hi Stephen good waffle matey question for you nuclear war is about to break out and you have time to save three games from oblivion as you head into the bunker what three games do you take now I'm going to I don't I don't really collect games I've got a lot of systems I've got a lot of games but I've got even more games on Everdrives, on cartridges, SD cards, etc. I'm not really fussed about owning a game. So for the purpose of this question, Stephen, I'm not going to base it on what three games would you keep. I'm going to base it on if I could only have three games to ever play again. I'm going into this nuclear war shelter and I can only get to play three games. What games would it be? And all the rest were gone. Eh, pool. You know what? It would probably have to be. I mean, I've got a massive list of my favorite games. It would have to be games where you don't get to an end. So something like I don't know, like Grand Theft Auto, or um, you know, a game where you actually do complete. You get to the end of the level. See something like uh, I don't know, Kung Fu Fighter. I think there's five levels and it goes back to the start and it just wraps around. It would have to be games where there is no end. So even something like Pipeline 2, Super Pipeline 2, which is one of my favourite games, I wouldn't really want that to be one of the games because I think you'd soon kind of get bored of it. For me, it would have to be three arcade games. Ah, blimey. It would probably be... It would probably be Berserk because I just love the game to bits. I think it's a fantastic game and it never ends. It would also... Oh, this is a tough one. I'm torn between Defender, Robotron and Track and Field. Now I know Track and Field technically just loops around a bit. I just love the feel, the sheer physical aspect of that game. Um, oh man, oh that's difficult, that's difficult. Oh. It would be, Berz I'm not going to put them in order. It would be Berserk, it would be, it would probably be Robotron and then Track and Field and Galaxian would be a strongly run fourth place. Yeah, that's a tough one. Ask me tomorrow and I would give you three completely different answers. But anyway, Stephen, thanks for your, your question, buddy. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, Milfy Swill Swinbuckle. That's an absolutely fantastic name. Thanks for asking my question, Main Meister. At around the 20,000 mark rocket ball... Uh, oh sorry, you're, you're, you're referring to what the point in the video I answered your question. Rocket Ball getting an update was a great shout by you. I used to love playing that game back in the day as it was also one of my favourite C64 games. I rate the game higher than the Bitmap Brothers speedball games. I'm exactly the same. Never quite got into them. Funnily enough, yeah, that's a game 
that's a game for another Lacosa or Main Meister uh, collab. Never really a fan of, as much as I loved sporting games, football games, I'm not a fan of like the modern games like FIFA. I could never get into speedball. I don't know what it was. There's just something that didn't gel with me at all. Um, yeah, as you say there, you never quite got into them either, even though they were loved in Amiga. I mean, Speedball 2 is one of the probably most fondly remembered Amiga games, but it's not one that I ever really played at all. I'm not quite sure why. Uh, let's quickly go through there. Uh, just see if there's any questions. Yeah, there we go. Colin Jones. Waffle question. Were there any games you could play indefinitely only quitting when you got tired or bored of? Jelly Monsters on the VIC-20 was mine. I could play it for hours without losing a life. Uh, to be able to do that, Colin, you'd have to be pretty good. I think the one game that I could play almost indefinitely, maybe not now, would be, I'm slipping down the, my chair again, it would probably be Commando on the C64, the elite version of Commando. I'm not that good at it now, but back then, I could quite literally just keep playing it continually, getting extra lives, can playing it continually. I can't think of any other game that I was that good at. Unfortunately, I've been playing video games for like the best part of almost 40 years, and I'm not actually that good at any. Uh, yeah, and an 8-bit face-off kerfuffle suggestion. Choplifter. It was first out in the Apple II, then ported to many home systems and even made it into the arcades. Out on so many systems, it could rival your live streams for time. <laughs> That's a good shout-out, Colin. I'll try and uh, pick that one up and run with it. So anyway, Cole, thanks for the question, mate. Um, Next... Ye oldie gamer Steve, top waffling as usual mate, thanks again for being a total gentleman and answering my silly questions. You're very welcome Steve, as I always say, if it wasn't for you guys supporting the channel and, you know, keeping the channel probably wouldn't exist. I have an easy one for you this week, you have a choice between playing a superb game that has ghastly music or a ghastly game that has superb music, which do you pick and why? Um. It would probably have to be the superb game with ghastly music. I can't think of any games that were brilliant with awful music, but there was quite a few games that were crap games, but had good music. Um, the last V8, one of them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, bad games with good music, what I would generally do, if, if it was a game that it just played the music, I would... I would maybe load it up and not actually play it and just listen to the music. Um, but I can't think of any amazing game that had terrible music. There were some, I can't think offhand, but there was, certainly, there was definitely some games where there were really good games and awful music. Quite funny, I was actually doing a, an Arcade Perfect my arse this week. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the name of the, 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 the video because it will be coming out next week. But... I looked at the PC DOS version of this game and yeah, primitive, I mean graphic wise it was quite primitive but it played really well, it played really 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 well but the music was just about the most god awful music I have ever ever heard. Now it was a PC DOS game, now I u it used, was it the Sound Blaster or, or not, in fact it probably wasn't the Sound Blaster card it would be, did it use the, the built-in speaker? I think it was. But honestly, this is up there with one of the worst bits of in-game music. It was just awful. It sounded like a completely tone-deaf person playing a, a, a flute. It was absolutely awful. If you stick, uh, if you watch the, what do you call it, Archie Perfect My Arse next week, you'll see what game I'm talking about. But no, as far as a great game with poor music or a poor game with bad, uh, good music, I would probably always have to go with the best game, Steve, because at the end of the day, you can turn the volume down. But you can't make a good game good. So, anyway, listen, thanks for your, your question, Steve. I appreciate that, mate. Ian Hunter, thanks again, Alan, for an entertaining waffle. You're most welcome, uh, welcome, Ian. And uh, down the rabbit hole, it's never a Friday waffle without Kevin asking me a couple of questions. Hi Alan, just a couple of questions for this week's waffle. 
First of all, I was enjoying your second channel there, but I see it's been a few weeks since you posted them. Just wondering if you're working in something, taking a break from it, or do you feel the need? Do you not need to uh, need to post? Sorry, do you not feel any need to post regularly there? Honest answer, Kevin. I've just not had any time. Um, I've not had any time to do make any more content for that. I definitely do want to keep the channel going because every now and again there there are going to be subjects that I want to talk about that don't really fit in with a, a gaming channel. So I will definitely be using that, you know, in future. Um, so it's not going anywhere, Kev. I've just simply not had any time. Uh, I'd love to say it's because I'm working on some real fancy project, but I would be telling complete lies. So, yeah, just not at any time. I've not actually been doing anything that I really felt warranted, worthy of making a video about, if that makes any sense, uh, Kev. Secondly, have you resisted buying any retro hardware due to its unreliability? For example, the Entex Adventure Vision or the Milton Bradley Microvision. Blimey Kevin, I can't even say I've heard either of these machines. Are they, were they actually arcade games or were they like the LED games, possibly? Um, when you buy any hardware, old hardware, you're always going to take, there's always an element of risk that, you know, you, you could pay good money for something and then it falls over and stops working. I mean, I bought a PlayStation 2 off a of mate, no, PlayStation 3 off a of mate, and I paid, I think it was 200 odd quid I paid for it, and within about a week or maybe two weeks, it completely gave up the ghost. Now, I wasn't going to go back to him and say, hey, wait a minute, you've sold me this crap, this dumb, uh, duff bit of hardware, because it did work for a week and then it just stopped working. And all right, in retrospect, I probably could have got it fixed, but I just, I think I sold it on eBay for parts. Something like that. So my point is, I've actually found that more modern hardware is more unreliable. I mean, I had, it was either four or five Xbox 360s getting the red ring of death. And some of them I'd hardly used at all. But because, you know, I, I didn't use it over such a long period of time, when it did eventually fall over, I was stuck. I never got any money back. I never got any free replacements at all. As far as old hardware goes, I mean, yeah, if I know that things like the Vectrex, they are, you know, they're, they're very old, they've got monitors in them, so every time I go to switch the Vectrex on, I'm always, I always hold my breath, I'm always half expecting it to not come on, because of the age of it, and that, that day will probably happen, and that's probably the reason I don't really use my uh, my Vectex all that often is I'm terrified it stops working, which sounds daft. Why have something not use it? But uh, yeah, I don't think there's ever been a bit of hardware I've not bought because of that, Kevin. But there is one piece of hardware that it would certainly be a consideration before I decided to buy it. But the thing is, it's never going to be something that happens because this piece of hardware is so rare and it is the, uh, the Sharp X, X, I can't even pronounce it, X68000, the Sharp, yeah, it's, it was a machine which was kind of based on the, the Capcom CPS1 hardware, so things like, um, things like Final Fight, a, oh, Strider, it had, it had identical hardware to the original arcade games, so it was a phenomenal, yeah, the Sharp X68000, it's a phenomenal piece of hardware. I would absolutely love to own one just because of the games. It's like, it'd be like having an arcade machine in your house. There's probably three reasons I'm never, I'm never going to own one. One, they're as rare as hen's teeth. They simply never, ever come up on eBay. Two, if they do, they are stupidly, un, uh, stupidly expensive. Three, you need to have, uh, you need to be able to speak Japanese because it never got released outside Japan. The system, the operating system is all in Japanese. And the fourth reason, which I never said, I said three, but the fourth one would be unreliability. Apparently they are quite unreliable, 
But again, you need to think about it's an old machine, you know. Um, so the point is, if I had the chance of buying one for like, I don't know, a thousand pounds, I would probably not buy it. Even if I had a thousand pounds spare, I probably wouldn't buy it because they're just so unreliable. I mean, when I was moving into my house, I was I was really tempted to actually get a, a proper arcade cabinet and I asked a couple of my mates and my mate Tony, Tony Temple, he said to me, look, Alan, he says, if you're prepared a, to constantly work on keeping this thing running and you're also happy to only have the one game to play, then get yourself an arcade machine, he says. But I would strongly consider you go down the main route or the jammer, you know, 101. He says, because the problem is when you buy an old piece of hardware, an old arcade game, whatever it is, chances are it's going to stop working at some point and you need to be able to fix it. And I don't have that kind of technical knowledge or ability to do. So for that reason, I decided to go for the meme cab, you know. Um, but now I can't say there is any one system, Kevin, that I wouldn't buy because of that. Maybe the, the Sharp X 68000, just because it's expensive and you need to be able to fix it as well. It's they're really unreliable. But again, it's maybe unfair to talk about something which was like 20, 30 years old and say, oh, it's unreliable. Because what, I mean, fridges or cookers or washing machines, they'll not last 30 years, or at least not, not any modern ones now, you know. I mean, that's just part and parcel. Everything's got a finite life lifespan on it. And the video game systems are the same. So anyway, Kev, thanks for the, the question, mate. Um, don't think there's any other questions yeah, my mate Charlie Farr fantastic news about your play Blackpool talk Alan not mentioning any names but the same old YouTuber podcasters have been running the expo circuit for years now it's about time they got new panellists and presenters such as yourself to freshen up the format understandable that you might have hesitated when first asked but you did the right thing by accepting as it's a really positive experience I took part in the Arcade Legends talk at Revival 2019 with John Studley and Tony Temple and I'll admit that I didn't say yes immediately as it's way out of my comfort zone. I'm so glad I did it though. It was great fun. You'll love it. I'm sure it will, uh, Dave. I'm sure it will be really good fun. Uh, and yeah, that is basically the last question, guys. So anyway, we're almost at an hour, so I'm going to get going. Again, apologies for the lack of dull... Uh, dull background and just my ugly face to look at um, next week I will try and get into shot with some of my kind of systems lying in the background again and sit in the old waffle chair so anyway guys I just want to say thanks as always for the constant support you know you guys are absolutely awesome and as always thank you very much for watching